Thank you very much for that powerful address. I'd like to call the panel now to the, to the stage and, and you, yes. And uh, you need a microphone to speak. So we're going to go in the order that people are on the program. We'll begin with Sujin Park from Garrett Seminary. We'll um, move then to um, two of my colleagues from here at Northwestern, Ben Summer and uh, Sani Umar. And finally, uh, we will return to Garrett with uh, Ken Vox, who will conclude the comments. And then uh, we'll, I'll invite Bishop Yunnan to uh, comment on the commenters, and we will hopefully have time, in fact, I know we will have time to uh, open this up for all of you for comment and, uh, and questions. So, uh, Sujin, would you like to? I think here, okay. so we can hear you. First, let me express my great appreciation for Bishop Yunnan's keynote lecture. I share with him his important concerns for reconciliation, social justice, and mutually respectful and fruitful interreligious diapraxis and dialogue. I also appreciate his concise and informative history of Luther's statements concerning Jews and Islam, and his helpful history of the Lutheran Church's responses and actions to ad address that mostly negative, those mostly negative histories, and to seek repentance and respectful affirmation of the faiths of Judaism, Islam, and other religions as well. More specifically, I for yeah. I that. <laughs> More specifically, I affirm Bishop Yunnan's insightful move to apply Luther's doctrine of justification with far greater communal aspects, not just that individual um, ju justification by faith alone, but communal and reconciling emphases, emphases that I do believe exist in that doctrine but too often get eclipsed and, and fall into the temptations of individualism and absolutism. Dr. Yunnan powerfully takes up Luther's doctrine of justification by faith alone and his doctrine of creation to argue for an emphasis upon peace, social justice, and communal reconciliation, and for practices that affirm the dignity of every human being and the dignity of other religions. Not only do I agree with Bishop Yunnan, but I would like to suggest um, two other things that I think strengthen his argument. One that reiterates something he's already doing, but press it even more, and, and then one that is a, a, a new element. One element I thought perhaps got lost in the de detail is that the other side of Luther's doctrine of justification by faith alone is exactly that good works done to neighbors, done out of love to neighbor. And actually, um, he very much did emphasize that. As many of you may know, Luther wanted to be known as the doctor of good works. That's how very important the good works are to his theology, to his life and his thought. One might ask then, well, who is your neighbor, Luther? Who is one's neighbor, according to Luther? Is it just a fellow Christian? And I think that it, a reading of his works, and particularly the freedom of a Christian, where this really starts to come out, um, really does have the possibilities, real possibilities, that he's not just talking about fellow Christians, although he may especially be talking about fellow Christians, but, some, to, but to all that one encounters. Indeed, Luther is clear that as Christians, this very love of neighbor expressed in good works to neighbors is the very essence of a fruitful witness of Christ. As Luther puts it, and I quote, each one should become, as it were, a Christ to the other. Thus, when Luther is at his best, he advocates this love of all neighbors and good works to all neighbors as the very foundation of a Christian witness. Secondly, I think there is another significant core principle of Luther's theology that's helpful in furthering a Christianity that better affirms the dignity of all humans and the dignity of other religions. Namely, this is his very prominent theme concerning the hiddenness of God. Now, we've addressed this theme a couple times in this conference thus far, mostly negatively, and I'm going to give a positive spin on it and, and, um, and tell you why I think it's helpful. It's a constant theme in his theology throughout his life, from his first lectures to his uh, on, on Psalms to his very last commentary on Genesis. And my understanding of the, this theological theme in Luther is that it has two basic functions. First, it's a tool that Luther uses to give a message of hope. 
The hidden God is a God who appears to be stern and punishing toward us, but in actuality is a God of mercy. Luther explains a key example of this merciful God in his explanation of the story of the Canaanite woman. If you remember the story of the Canaanite woman, the woman says, Jesus, Jesus, will you come, come answer me and come heal my daughter? And Jesus says to her, um, I've only come to the lost sheep of Israel, and is it fair to take the children's food and throw it, throw it to the dogs? And then she says, well, don't even the dogs get to have the crumbs under the table. And Luther uses this as a picture of the hidden God, that though God may appear stern and punishing and have a no to you in, in appearance, that actually he applauds this woman for grasping the eternal yes behind that no, that apparent no. It's a real message of hope and that we are to hold God's to God, God to God's promises. Secondly, this theme of God's hiddenness also teaches us that one can never grasp or fully contain the full revelation that is God. Knowledge of God is always accommodated knowledge. God often comes to us in ways that surprise. He talks about subcontrario, coming under contrary appearances. One must always operate with the caution that the revelation one has is partial and incomplete. God, says Luther, is not only hidden outside of revelation, God is hidden in the very revelation itself. In other words, no one person, and I might add no one religion, can claim any kind of absolutism, can claim this full knowledge of a complete revelation of God. This, I believe, can be a powerful caution against the kind of absolutism that can happen in many religions and is usually the very core source of violence that comes out of that religion. Now, I must also add in conclusion that as a Reformation historian, I do have a large investment in affirming the ongoing importance of Luther. But this importance for me is not only to name Luther's can, ways that Luther can have a positive ongoing resource for us, but also um, it includes for me as a historian the ways Luther and his theology have fallen short of this vision. In other words, the history of Luther's views of and practices towards Jews and Muslims can also teach us possible pitfalls and things to be avoided. Luther's beliefs and practices were deeply shaped by his medieval context. Thus, in his day, he could actually understand love of neighbor to include the need for execution of false heretics, teachers, Jews, or Muslims, as actually a way of protecting your fellow Christian and as a way of loving your neighbor, your fellow Christian, and even as loving the, the um, person who commits the sin by naming, helping them recognize their sin. This is a whole different world than what, what we're used to. And so I mean to say Luther himself failed to live up to the very full potential power of his doctrines of good works done in love for neighbor and his teachings about creation and his teachings of the hiddenness of God. So let me offer four very, very briefly ways that I might use Luther to give warning concerning potential pitfalls. And in fact, I do this in my classroom all the time. And here I need to say that when I say we or us, I'm talking as a as a confessed Christian, and I, don't, and I only include in the we and the us those who, who name themselves so. And first, Luther's example teaches us that we need to be critical readers of our surrounding culture. Luther's culture was one dominated by anti-Christian and anti-Muslim Jews, I mean anti-Jewish and anti-Muslim views, let alone the legitimacy of using violence to deal with so-called offenders against the Christian faith. How also might we be blind to our own culture and the assumptions of that culture and legitimate acts of violence, such as, may I say, a Western nation declaring war on an Islamic nation, or may I say also the use of torture to find information in the face of terror? Second, Luther and his contemporaries can shed light on the historical ties between religion and violence. For example, as a Christian, I ask, what drives Christianity toward the temptation of absolutism? What drove Luther and his, his contemporaries toward this temptation? Indeed, in answer to this, I might start with the Protestant reformer's immense concern for certainty. One way to understand the passion of a Protestant reformer such as Luther is his concern for certainty. Against the uncertainties and anxieties that Luther believed the Catholic Church of his day propounded and afflicted its people, Luther meant to bring a message of hope, and by that he, he also thought it had to be a message of certainty. The certainty of a God who keeps God's promises and loves and forgives and saves in a way that's not dependent on any work of your own, but only on the certainty of God, God's self. 
Yet the pursuit of certainty is, I think, always a precursor to the very pitfall of absolutism and then violence. And I might ask Luther, what is faith if one pursues certainty? Is not the pursuit of certainty exactly contrary to a life of true and profound faith? I think Luther also in, embodies for us the temptations that can happen in practices of Jewish Christian Muslim dialogue of the temptations of inclusivism and exclusivism. Luther's 1523 treatise that Jesus Christ was born a Jew is an example of inclusivism. He wants to talk with Jewish persons because he wants to convert them. And then in the 1546 harsh negative treatises, he says, don't even have any contact at all with Jews. And that's an example of extreme exclusivism. And these are temptations that will always face us when we're, we're trying to have conversations together, that we not let this dialogue fall into a monologue and that uh, we recognize a history and, and come with repentance. While I agree with the possibility that Luther may have tried to make truth claims in a less absolutist way than how they were received, I, as Christine Helmer has suggested, the fact of the matter is that Luther firmly stood by his truth claims, even when it meant not only breaking unity with the Catholic Church, but also his fellow Protestants. In this way, Luther's life and theology can be understood as privileging purity of doctrine over and over and against the virtue of unity. While I think there is an importance for purity of doctrine in a particular community, when it's pursued without the counterbalancing virtues of unity, peace, and harmony, it will quickly, quickly fall again into absolutism and violence. We do need clear identity and boundaries that define us. But I would, I'd like to suggest that the very first boundary that we draw, we as Christians, is that we act out of love and peace and reconciliation towards all peace, people, that this is our centrally constraining, restraining principle of um, like that simple song, they will know us by Christian, as we are Christians by our love. Could we really truly live up to that? Finally, since my own area of scholarship focuses on Protestant biblical exegesis, I think we can also find a warning concerning potential pitfalls in Luther's exegesis. As much as I love to study Luther and I love the man, I find him stimulating, I often find myself dismayed at the recurrent anti-Jewish teachings found in his writing, particularly anti-Jewish even more than anti-Muslim. My own research is in agreement with Heike Overman that this anti-Judaism is there consistently from the very beginning to the very end, it's, and it's unfortunately deeply tied into the way he reads scripture. The warning I find here is the warning of the Jewish scholar Jules Isaac when he writes about the dangers of a teaching of contempt. If there's one rule of reading scripture that I hope Christians would agree upon and abide by, it would be to affirm that whenever a reading of scripture propounds a theology of contempt of another or promulgates violence in any form, it cannot be a faithful reading of scripture. Again, I give my hearty applause to Dr. Yunin's fine address and I look forward to our further conversations. Thank you.